Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mars stream this Wednesday night, where we have Solo Arts Heal. It's our 13th day in our second Solo Arts Heal since we started Mars stream a little over a week ago. I want to thank you all for joining us. We have a wonderful show tonight, and I'm going to let Gail tell you about it. But let me just first tell you about what's coming up for the rest of the week. On Thursday night, we have Stephanie's Marsh Dream. That's me. I'm Stephanie Wiseman, Artistic Director and Founder of the Marsh. And my interview guest tomorrow is the beloved San Francisco uh, icon and pose, uh, State Senator and Representative Tom Amiano. And he's got a new book called Kiss My Gay Ass. And I can't wait to talk to him about it. Tom is someone who's performed at the Marsh, who has done so much, who's a humanitarian and who's an incredible person. And before that, we will be listening to Ellen Hoffman play the piano between 7 and 7.25. We'll start at 7.30. Um, and then on Friday night, we have Bingo. Bingo with Josh Cornbluth. I can't think of anything funnier than what I saw him do last week. Imagine playing bingo with a red diaper baby. Incredibly funny. And on Saturday night and Sunday, we will be having, we will be screening Charlie Van Varen's Genome Out of a Bottle. And we're thrilled about that. So, Let's take it back right now. I'm so thrilled that Gail Shickley is hosting this tonight. Gail is a good friend and we have been working together in her incredible room at APAP each year where, we, where she hosts a lot of solo performers and tenors and everything like that. And out of this time this year, we put together a consortium of solo performers who work in healing in the arts. And this is what this program comes from. And I'm gonna let Gail tell you about it. So welcome Gail, thank you so much for being here. Thanks Stephanie, it's great to be here. I really appreciate it. And um, at APAP, the Association of Performing Arts Presenters, we have the annual conference every January, which is a massive conference and lots of showcases. And it's been wonderful to have you perform for us as well in, in uh, the room I produce. And so I look forward to being able to see your show as well on Solo Arts Heals. Um, and uh, and hello to everyone. Um, tonight's show is about caregiving. And to begin, it couldn't be more appropriate than to honor Earth Day. Uh, it's the 50th anniversary. And today, as I listened to the birds singing along with the kids singing next door, I was full of hope and caring for Mother Earth is our greatest responsibility and our greatest challenge. And I look forward to our continued good work together to save her. We are all of us caregivers in life with good parenting, perhaps at the top of the list. Caregiving is providing for the physical and emotional needs of a family member or a friend at home. Caregiving for people who are mentally or physically disabled, perhaps ill from cancer or another disease is a special need. And as I learned in caretaking for my husband who died of brain cancer, requires special planning for medical needs, dealing with legal and financial issues in addition to, to love and care. With us tonight to tell his story is Samuel A. Simon presenting excerpts from his award-winning solo show, The Actual Dance, the real life story of a husband finding the strength and beauty as his wife's lover, love partner and care partner as they anticipate an unhappy ending to her breast cancer. He searches for an answer to, how can I do what I know I have to do? The show has a happy ending and is as much a love story as a medical story. I've seen it and audiences laugh, cry, and then cheer. Um, Manhattan Digest called it a life affirming ode to commitment and boundless love. The show has been touring seven years with performances worldwide. It's been presented internationally, theatrically, in diverse venues, including Johns Hopkins Center on Spirituality and Chaplaincy, the National Conference of Breast Imagers, Grace Harlem Church, Hebrew Union College of Jerusalem, as well as an off-Broadway off run at Theater Row in New York. The actual dance was written by Sam Simon, 
Gabrielle Mizels is the dramaturge and Eli Zoller, the music director. And now, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands up and please welcome an excerpt with Sam Simon from his show, The Actual Dance. There is a dance, a dance that one day each and every one of us will dance. Dance takes place in a grand ballroom with a fabulous orchestra. The orchestra, I think, actually plays whatever song that the dancers themselves want to hear. And even though I have been to so many of these events, and even though I have the routine down pat, even so, I don't think I can actually recall a single tune ever played by one of the orchestras. You see, you can come to one of these events as a guest of the dancers, or you might just end up in the gallery watching as someone you know or love is dancing. You don't get to dance yourself though until either it is your turn or you've been invited to be the dance partner of someone you love. Hmm. You know, it just might be true that only the dancers themselves actually recognize the song that the orchestra is playing. The orchestra. <laughs> you know, the most amazing thing about the actual dance is in fact, the orchestra. You see, the orchestra doesn't even exist until it might be needed. And as an orchestra might be needed, somehow the, the musicians know and it forms as each musician, instrument in hand appears, walking across the dance floor, mounting the orchestral riser. The actual dance begins. When it is my turn to dance, I want to dance with the person I love most in this world. And if it's her turn first, I want to be her dance partner and I want us to dance a waltz, a slow, elegant, flowing, beautiful waltz. The person I love most in this world is Susan. Susan Merrill Cowmans, that's her maiden name. You know, I can remember the first time I ever even just noticed Susan. We hadn't even met yet. She's living in Houston and I'm living in El Paso. We both belong to the same youth groups, neither one for boys in El Paso and Susan, the one for girls in, in Houston. We were just 16 years old and we were traveling to the same conference with our respective youth groups in Texarkana, Texas. Well, I remember this girl with curly black hair and big braces on her teeth. I kept noticing her in that, you know, 16-year-old boy sort of way. And I may have stared at her a lot, but I never got up the guts to introduce myself to her before the convention was over. Oy. So here I am sitting in the Greyhound bus that's gonna take me back to El Paso. And I do remember this, seriously. I do remember this. I, I'm next to the window and I look out the window. Here's this dark haired racist girl walking along the bus waving at the window and is she waving at me? She later said that she was. <laughs> oh, I also remember that first date. Well, that too was just sort of a first date. It was just three years later. And we were going to the Greyhound races in Juarez, that is Greyhound dog races. And that's Juarez, Mexico, right across the border from El Paso. Amazingly, Susan ended up going to college in El Paso at Texas Western. And of course, I'm still living at home going to Texas Western. Anyway, as that night began, <coughs> Susan was in the front seat with her date, Steve, and I'm in the back seat with my date, Jane. Now, neither one of these dates is going very well. On the way back to El Paso for Morez, Susan is in, I'm sorry, Jane is in the front seat with Steve. 
and Susan is in the back seat with me. And that is how it became our first date. Now, it didn't take us very long to fall in love, though I do wonder whether two 20-year-olds really understood what love meant. We got married in August of 1966. So here I am, 34 years later, in the spring of 2000. It is the first time ever that I experience an orchestra forming. And I have to admit, it scares and it confuses me. It all starts with Susan updating me about her annual checkup. <clears throat> Everything's fine, Sam. She tells me, and then almost as an afterthought, um, one of these classic Columbo moments, if you will. Oh, just one more thing, dear. The doctor wants me to see a surgeon to check out something she felt in my right breast. Now, honey, she doesn't think it's anything to worry about. It just felt funny to her. Well, I am surprised, but I'm not worried. After all, it's going to be Susan's fourth breast biopsy. <clears throat> Don't worry, I try to reassure her. Remember, honey, you, you had a mammogram just two months ago. Here, let me see if I feel anything. Humor and sex fix everything. Oh, well. I'm, <clears throat> the doctor's words, they're strange, a new vocabulary that I, I don't understand immediately, though their import is clear to me. <clears throat> stage three. Why stage three? Well, because of the size of the tissue with cancer, because there are no margins. What, what margins? Well, what are margins? Well, now remember, Sam, we didn't actually find a tumor. We just removed some Breast tissue. Now, <clears throat> in what we took out of Susan, there was no normal breast tissue. Cancer, where the cancer ends, there's supposed to be normal tissue. But what we took out of her, there was no normal breast tissue. Well, I now know what these words mean. You see, Susan's mother died of metastasized breast cancer at the age of 56. Susan is 54. I understand that the outcome is inevitable. Our first visit with her oncologist, Dr. Blonder, is after an extensive double mastectomy and after the lab report that shows that the cancer has spread to Susan's lymph nodes and throughout the rest of her body. I sit with Susan in the waiting room. The nurses come out to take Susan into the exam room with Dr. Blonder and I insist on being in that exam room with Susan and Dr. Blonder. So I follow Susan in he has her take her blouse off, lay down on the exam table. How strange is it to watch as another man puts his hand on Susan's bare chest. His finger slides along the lips of the incision point, and all of a sudden he stops. He doesn't say anything. He does a military about face and walks to the opposite wall. He picks up a telephone. Now well, that is weird. I wonder if he was paged. He walks back, puts his finger back on the chest for just a moment, and then turns to us to say that he's found a lump on Susan's chest at the incision point, and it needs to be looked at right away. He has made an appointment with us for the next day with the breast surgeon to have the lump removed. To schedule it, the lump will remove the next week. Oh, 
I need to talk to someone. Later that afternoon, after we're home, I go out on errands, and even though it, it's late, it's about nine o'clock at night, I wonder whether our rabbi is still at the temple. I decide to just stop by, hoping that she's there. It's, it's committee night, and she should be there, and I really, really, really need to talk to someone. And the rabbi is there when I arrive. But she doesn't have time for a real talk. She has a family of her own. It's late at night. She does need to get home. So she invites me into her office where she's going to pack up while she's packing up. I sit down and I start, Rabbi, I need to talk about, and she interrupts with, oh, you're sad that Susan's not going to be around to see the grandkids go grow up, but she won't be at their Bar and bat mitzvahs, right? I don't react. I don't say anything. She doesn't understand. She doesn't get it. No, no, it's none of that. I screamed silently. What I need to know, what I need to know is how am I going to do that? How am I going to dance the last, the actual dance with Susan? Well, I, I do walk the rabbi to her car and I thank her for her time, though I don't tell her about the voices or the orchestra. I need to talk to someone else. So I make an appointment with the psychiatrist I've been seeing every now and then for the last 20 years. It's been a while, but his office is familiar, much the same. As it's always been. I sit down for what's going to turn out to be the only ses session, and once again, I cry. And I tell him about the orchestra and the ballroom and the dance and how real it is to me. Secretly, I'm afraid that I might be losing my mind, and I wonder. I don't know. <laughs> I hope that'll give me medication. The last time I was going through a transition, he gave me medication, and I think that medication will remove the images, erase the orchestra, and change the future by changing when, what's going on in my head. And instead, he calls it a metaphor. And he says that it's beautiful. It never occurred to me that the actual dance is beautiful. I've always feared it as tragic and devastating. His words have a dramatic effect on me. Beauty, dignity. Rather than fearing the dance, I think I'm going to be able to get ready for the dance. And in fact, I now understand that the actual dance will be the ultimate consummation of our love. Susan's brother, Melvin, comes up from Houston to be with me in Houston for the procedure to remove that lump from Susan's chest. Now, if the lump turns out to be cancer, as everyone expects it to be. Susan's prognosis is grim. I'm sitting with Melvin in the waiting room and I can hear the orchestra playing as clearly as I hear anything else in the world. In fact, I'm confused as to why Melvin doesn't hear it. Now, but now I am ready. I am ready to hear the grim prognosis. I am ready to dance, the actual dance with Susan. When all of a sudden, the orchestra stops playing. Before Susan arrives, the doctor comes out 
It's not the cancer, Sam. It's not the cancer. It's just a plain old water cyst. <laughs> His voice is cracking. But I'm confused. I look over at Melvin and wonder whether I made a mistake in having him come up from Houston. Susan struts into the waiting room, dressed, ready to go. She's all business. Let's go home, Sam. Let's go home, Melvin. As I drive Susan and Melvin home, my eyes see not the road ahead, but instead the inside of a now empty grand ballroom where only moments before the actual dance was in full production. It sits semi-dark, silent, empty now. I'm the only one here. The orchestra off to play somewhere else. But for how long? As we go to Dr. Blonder for the next appointment, he reminds us that Susan's prognosis remains highly guarded. And he maps out an extensive course of chemotherapy and radiation treatments. And I will be there for each one of those treatments and each one of the follow-up doctor's appointment, for that is my role in this new world. And I will listen for the orchestra. Even today, almost 20 years later, I listen. I listen with my heart where my love sits for the ever so slight change in the balance of the universe that would indicate that a new and different orchestra has been called to form. Is, is that them playing? Is that them playing? Is that them playing? Sam. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful performance. I Let's all take a breath, shall we? Mm -hmm. ah, this is a very powerful piece. And um, thank you for sharing this beautiful glimpse into your meaningful story. It's the actual dance that many of us have shared and, come on, come on. and will one day share. And uh, I do want to jump in and just note, Susan is just fine. <laughs> and welcome Susan we're so happy to have you here I'm most interested to know your take on all this and um but first I want to um say that when Sam performs um you often do talkbacks with audiences with healthcare professional Reverend Gregory Johnson an ordained interfaith minister whose work and ministry is focused on the world of family caregiving Tonight is no exception. And we're honored that Reverend Johnson will be joining us in just a few moments. But first for the audience, I wanna tell you that we have with us not only three gems tonight, but an incredible resource for caregivers. We'll be posting some of these resources for our listeners in the chat room throughout the rest of this program. Reverend Johnson is the president and executive officer of Greg Johnson Partnerships International the parent entity for the International Center for Caregivers and Carers. He has also been and is a family caregiver. Sure. Greg is the chief advisor for family caregiving for, uh, to the CEO of Emblem Health. As an ordained interfaith, interfaith minister, Greg also has served the Marble Collegiate Church in New York City. He's been honored by many city, state, national and international organizations. Reverend Johnson was elected as a fellow at the New York Academy of Medicine for his work and contributions in the field of family caregiving. He founded and established the New York City Family Caregiver Coalition and the New York City Partnership for Family Caregiving Corps, which brings focus to the issue of family caregivers and the corporate and the, into the corporate world. And among many publications and articles, Care for the Family Caregiver, A Place to Start, written in 2005 with later editions in 2010 and 2016, which remains a central text now available in Spanish and Chinese from Emblem Health. With Reverend Marion um, uh, Gambardella, Reverend Johnson authored Peace, Be Still, Prayers and Affirmations for Family Caregivers. And 
um, the sources that you're now seeing on, on the chat, um, Reverend Johnson's YouTube channel is Family Caregiving with the Rev. His weekly broadcast, Friday with the Rev, is archived on this channel along with many other resources, broadcasts, and interviews. And most recently, Reverend Johnson addressed the United Nations Conference on Homelessness in New York City, a speech that I enjoyed reading earlier today. He continues his U.S. work and international focus as he resides both in New York City and Bali, Indonesia. Since And since its creation, Reverend Johnson has had the joy of doing many talkbacks for the actual dance. And we're so happy to have you with us here tonight. Reverend Johnson, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Gail, please call me Greg. Call me Greg. I appreciate your kind, your kind remarks. And Sam, thank you for yet another magnificent sharing of the actual dance. I had the privilege of meeting Sam through a clergy friend of mine in New York after Sam had written this. And I sat down and I heard him tell the story. I went to a reading and on both a professional level and a personal level, I absolutely fell in love with Sam, with Susan and the actual dance. As a person whose ministry is in the world of family caregiving, I was thrilled with it because it was yet another and often not discussed face of family caregiving. Often when we talk of family caregiving, we do think of children and probably that's been the one area we have focused less on simply because there are so many resources. We have spent more of our time talking of the family caregiver whom I often call the silent patients because no one thinks of them. And we know healthcare is a three-legged stool. It's uh, someone who's ill, the professional caregivers, and the family caregivers. Well, the first two legs of that stool get a lot of attention, but a lot doesn't get paid to the family caregiver. And then when it does, it tends to be people will talk about people my age, grandma and grandpa, the seniors. Well, there are so many other faces, and I'm privileged to speak on that frequently. And when Sam brought this to me, I was thrilled because here was a man's story, a man of faith, and a man who was willing to vulnerably share his story, his story of his wife's breast cancer and his journey in it. And we've seen just a part of it. The entire play is powerful, powerful. And I, I can't urge people enough to want to invite Sam to be with them. Now that was professionally. Personally, I was deeply touched by it. Because unlike Sam and Susan, I've danced the actual dance with every member of my immediate family, with my son in 2005 and my late husband of 41 years in 2011. So we were three, and then we were two, and now I'm my family. And in each one, I learned so much. Our son lived in Bali, so it was cross-cultural, it was international. And the metaphor of the actual dance is truly something I've been blessed to do. I may say it in certain theological words, which are comforting to me, but it was the actual dance. And I, like Sam, shocked myself that I was able to do it. But I was spiritually given that strength. And Sam tells that story so beautifully, how it all began. And then as they say, the rest is history. We even did off Broadway there for quite a number of weeks and it was so much fun. And we've played in so many interesting places, but this has always been the fun part. Now, it's been a serious play, so I want to just lighten the moment. Because I think one of the most wonderful stories, and Susan, bless your heart for this, because you could have killed the whole project. Sam wrote the play. Sam was preparing to take it to New York to read it to people. 
Well, who do you think he invited to go with him? Susan, who didn't know anything about the play. So you two take it away. Tell us a little bit of that story, Susan. Yes, let's hear this. Uh, okay. Um, we were on the train, and I knew that he had been writing something for quite a while. Because he would say to me, I'm going to go downstairs and work on this writing that I'm doing. I had no idea what it was about or anything. And he decided that he had to tell me on the way to New York because there was going to be this reading and he could not hide it anymore. So he said, I have something for you to read. I still didn't know. I started reading and tears started mm -hmm. coming down my eyes. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I never knew you felt this way. You kept all of those feelings hidden from me because one of the things that I said while I was going through the whole ordeal was I wanted everybody to be positive and I wanted us to think positive. So there was no way that I knew what these true feelings were. And as I said, the tears came and I turned to him and hugged him and gave him a big kiss on the train and all the people looked around like, what's happening? Can I, can I, can I just, and it's, I'm always surprised and even by this medium tonight, um, I've had a slightly different feeling and thought than I have the last seven years. And I don't know why, but I realize, I want to say it in a different way. And I don't even know if I said it to you before, uh, Greg. I don't think until I wrote the play that I knew I had the feelings that I had. And, and by that, I guess it's, I couldn't have given voice to them then. You experience something and that's deeply emotional. And it, the writing, the play, and then the performing itself helped me understand what I was feeling. And this was 11 years later. So interesting. So every time we talk about it, something new. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. And this really goes into a second question that I want you two to share with, because it's something that's so powerful. It is something that the arts very often, and I love the name of this program, it's through the arts that we heal. You look at this play because when the, um, when the ordeal was literally over, Susan, you had an attitude that, all right, it's over, let's get on with life. I, I, and I've heard you say that and, and, and do speak of that. But Sam, and you've just done it for us again tonight. You've gone to yet one more level of Sam Simon because you have told that story. You have gone deeper and shared through the arts and hearing your own words was really a healing experience. And I've watched you and I've watched and listened to you 70 or 80 times as we've done talk. Uh, but, <laughs> There is a dance. No, that's your line. <laughs> it, uh, I, I love what you did, but it is so powerful because it, it has been an ongoing journey. Writing it was hugely important. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that because that is so important for, and, and it's very relevant in the times that we're going through right now. It's, it's through art and these sorts of things that we're going to heal. Yes, uh, and I do hope that we're going to get a chance also for others to be able to ask some questions. Yeah. I think that it's the one, a core part of this journey that I was on and have discovered is it's about anticipation of the worst. And clearly, in some ways, we're in the middle of that, whether we've been exposed or we might be exposed or we're all locked in our homes. It's easy to to, to uh, catastrophize our lives. The journey to loss, and I know, Gail, you've gone through it as well. And I know others on, the, on this Zoom probably have too. 
you know, the anticipation of that. But I, I, you know, your life goes on. We went through it. Uh, it was always in my mind, and it would come up at different times and different experiences and pop back up. Um, I ended up doing for pers- professional development in a company improv. You know, I you know, hand out to improv. Uh, it was through the experience of learning how to both let go and be sp- be open to what's inside of you in the moment that this play found me uh, eventually through some exercises. Uh, one was in particular, you know, it, tell a story, improvise a story, write it down, perform it, improvise a story. And this pieces of this became just, you know, I don't, they just came out of me. They came, they, they started happening. And the way people reacted to it pulled more out of me. Uh, and that's, that is in part, so art's power is both in watching it, but it's in doing it. And that's why I'm so glad Gail and others on this call too have, have been part of this initiative to how to raise that up about the power of art, both as a performer and doer of art, as well as the audience. Uh, it's so true. Yeah, arts, arts really does heal. And, and when you're looking at caregiving, I think about 25% of American families, some 65 million people serve as unpaid caregivers and family members, um, special needs children, life partners, and others in need. And, um, and, and as a caregiver, it's, it's a, as you put it, Sam, it's a journey of that fear of loss, the anticipation of death, and the ultimate perspective of the gift and dignity that you said of, of, of being involved at facing the un, unimaginable in our, in our lives. And, and again, as you said, a journey many of us face today. And um, I think, Greg, you had talked about um, that you, we're, we're caregivers, not cure givers. Absolutely. Talk a little bit about that. Yes, that's something that I, I thank you very much, Gail, for asking that. I always remind people that we are called caregivers. We're giving care. We are taking exactly the pieces that are there, accepting them and moving forward. We leave the curing to the divine and to the medical world and people for whom that is. And in doing that, this brings me actually to a question that I was going to share with all of you because it's so relevant to Sam's play but it's equally relevant to everything that's happening right now. And I go through this conversation sitting right here. I've learned to talk to my computer uh, a great deal. (laughs) Weeks when it works. (laughs) But one of the issues that constantly comes up, and it's about caregiving, it's about living. The question isn't, is not why, the question is what. And that's probably the hardest thing for anyone to go through. Because when something that's very tragic happens or we anticipate and create the drama, um, which is something that we're all very good at doing and it's one of the things we talk about in caregiving. Today, at this moment, your care recipient, you, the doctor, we're all fine. Nobody's hair is on fire. We're going to make it for another minute. But what happens is so often when someone learns certain information, particularly about health and so forth, what do they do? They don't look at the present. They go to the funeral or they go to why, oh, if they'd have done this or if they'd have done that or if this and that. That's the why. The why is the past tense. And even if you knew every answer to the whys, it's not going to change the past. Today is today. It's the present. And that can be a gift. If we can look at it and say, all right, what can we do given the circumstances? And that was the magic that was happening, Sam. I hear constantly in the play with you. The two of you, you went through everything. You had her dead and buried. She was going on just fine. But that's it. And that's so absolutely natural. Then you realized you went through the whole family history. 
and and that's in, in the further the full version of the play. So you, I understand, and the audience understands why you would have reacted that way because you've had so much cancer death in your family and in your life. But you were able to take that then and say, I need help in this conversation. And I loved when you went to the rabbi and I loved when you went to the therapist. I'm a minister who always talks about my therapist because people don't think clergy have therapists. Well, I own bottom drawer in my therapist's office. But it, it was so important because it brought you to say, not only I can do this, and you could say honestly how you were feeling, which is so important. And it's the reason we encourage caregivers to go to support groups because it's pieces of you and pieces of you and pieces of you and pieces of me that put us all back together. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hear in the actual dance and I love it so much. So just chat a bit on that if you like. Well, I just want to add one little, uh, a variation on it, and it is. I've reflected, you know, the care, the word caregiver can quickly evoke ideas of, and it's in the full version, holding that metal, you know, semicircular metal plate in front of her in the hospital as she throws up, helping her to, you know, do things, emptying of anybody's on here has had breast cancer, those two small white plastic bulbs filled with red liquids that. But the, but the real journey is, in fact, the one with what I call the care partner. So there is the, there's the part of giving the care, but the real journey, I'm holding her hand when I say this, okay, <laughs> is, you know, and I, and I think it's in this, it's, it's about your breaking heart, right? It's that, that is, the rest of it almost doesn't matter in some ways, right? It's that part. And that is what I understood more, ever more deeply and continue to. Uh, and so, yeah. yeah. When you go through something like that, it deepens your relationship, you know, because you become so close in a different way. You're facing a whole different possibility. And, um, I know I certainly felt that way with my husband. We we became very, very close through the years of um, his illness. I had someone once say to me, using those similar words, as I was talking about Putra, our son. And I said, my heart's just broken because he was a young man, very talented. Um, and I said, my heart is broken. And they said, may it be broken open to greater and living. Ah, this and was I, I should pass that on because it meant so much to me and it has been true. Mm -hmm. Because although, and, and for all of us, our loved ones are never enough time with them. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have given up the 20 years I had. So um, how do you think it relates to the current environment? We're seeing all this fear of loss and anticipation of of getting sick and um, how we, it kind of relates to how we're caregiving each other. It seems I see people being so thoughtful on the street and how we are, be careful not to approach each other. And um, I'm seeing a lot of outpouring of kind of love and caregiving just in the communities when we have to go shopping or um, out there. How do you think, what do you think about that? Are you asking? Yes. Me? Uh, definitely, definitely. I mean, I'm sitting in Manhattan. We're not supposed to be those caring people. Well, today I had to go to the bank for something. And all of a sudden in came a lady who rearranged the line. Well, she happens to be a nurse. <laughs> and then she gave a lecture on how to take your gloves off and do your face. It was fabulous. And I thought only in New York. And then later this evening, I needed to run a quick errand two doors down to do some takeout food. One of the restaurants is open and I'm very tired of my cooking. So I was very happy to go. And as I went, I ran into another neighbor who had a huge bag that they were carrying and it was filled with masks and gave me a whole tube yeah. 
huge things of masks, which I will um, give to uh, some support workers that truly, truly need them. So it's random acts of kindness, as I like to say, that are just popping up all over. And I hear it on chat. I hear it in support groups that I've been doing. I hear it in 12-step groups that I'm very active in working with. And uh, and it's incredible. Mm-hmm. And it is. You're probably out. You're in right the thick of it there in New York. And um, and Sam and, and Susan, how are you finding that? I don't know if you're out as much. Um, and you're also in Virginia, are you? We, we try to stay isolated. You know, well, two things. And then I'll let you talk too. <laughs> uh, one, well, we we are finding moments now. You know, you think after fifty three and two third years, we might know each other completely. But you know, there's time to together. We we find we discover some new things about us, not each other, but about us. us. Um, and they're great discoveries. By the way, go to my website and read some of my poems. I have written a poem called Us, and I love it. That's my favorite poem. That reminds me, you um, this month, being a poetry month, you had did a blog, did you not? And you had an interview with a poet and did yes. some of your poetry. Yes, yes. So I, um, Jackie Jules, was it? Yeah, Jackie yeah, Jules. Jules. You know, I got to tell you, if you, if you went into my history, I'm the most unlikely poet you would ever, person to be a poet. <laughs> Sam was a lawyer who worked for Ralph Nader for many years. <laughs> the first consumer. <laughs> An amazing background <laughs> you have. Um, oh, goodness. But I don't know if you wanted to add about the moment now, Susan, any of you? No, I think you said, he, he tends to say everything in the right way. <laughs> So I, I generally say, you're right, or sometimes I do have to stop and he's learning and he's saying, you can stop me <laughs> you know, and, and redirect me. So it's, it's, it's good. You know. and, and of course, the Washington, D.C. area, um, not like New York and Virginia in particular. Uh, I know there's on the news today about people wanting to but most of the people we know and being very careful and the stores are adapting and um, you know, the, the people we know and the neighbors in our area are more, most gracious and uh, we've not run into any problems. And in our more immediate communities, I think everybody is in this state of uncertainty. We don't know. We can't, we went from, I think I say we, I think the, the world has gone from, we know what next week, we have our plans, we have, and not having any idea, really. Right, it's all, everything's um, changed, yeah. And that, it, um, I guess there's one other, uh, thought about that, because it just, uh, the, in the art, there's an article in the New York Times, in fact, uh, on the uh, op-ed page, by someone who spoke about this moment versus when they had cancer. So it's worth a read. I, 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 Is that in today? In today's yeah, time. Yeah, listen to Very good. Thanks for pointing that out. I also want to um, ask our um, viewers if anybody has any questions, just put it up in the chat and um, our guests would be happy to answer them um, or try to answer them for you at any rate. So please, um, if you have any questions, please put those in so we have a chance to uh, have you be part of our conversation. Is it, yeah, in the article, they talked about they, the moment reminded them about as they thought going through the cancer, they thought that uh, they wanted to, the, the writer wanted to be able to do a couple things just one more time. And some of those same urges of, you know, once this is over, I'm going to want to do, make sure I get things done, that time might be more limited. Uh, Um, I, I, I'm sorry, was there something else? I wanted to also um, mention that, and I find this very interesting, you, you also have um, another uh, person, Chuck Obasi, performing yes. this show. So Chuck, we do have another version. Uh, it's a little, it was a learning experience to watch another 
person played me as a character and the words I wrote. Uh, we did a couple of things. First of all, uh, he's a different person in that he's an African-American younger man. He is a professional actor and uh, very, uh, I've learned a lot from him and the way he does it. Not because the racial thing makes it different per se. I think the racial difference is, I think people like something this intimate, relate better when the person on the stage might have had their same background or more similar to background. But it, it, I love it that I've learned from him. And I would just say one last thing that I've learned that I am bound by my experience as I perform. I can't break out of it as much as and an actor who does it uh, reacts to the words on the page and presents the same words, but with a different energy and a different way. Besides, he's also, by the way, choreographed, so he moves more than I do. Ah, lovely. Well, you, you do a beautiful job on, on stage. But it would be interesting to see him perform it, which I haven't done, although we've talked in, a little bit in, in Zoom chats, because 14% um, of care recipients are, are between the ages of 18 and 49. And there's a lot of younger, you know, caregiving is, uh, isn't just for, even though we do have a graying population and we know that, that, that a lot of us are going to be having these needs and as we face it, and we talk about that a lot, but um, I think it happens to all of us at all ages. And this is certainly something now that we're seeing with COVID there's, um, you know, as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just want to pop in there. Absolutely. And one of the gifts, of it being what's happening now, the younger people are of the computer age. Today, you cannot get most people on the telephone or a helpline or that sort of thing. It right. will just ring and ring because people know how to do this, uh, use the computer. They're not like me. One of the things I have been blessed with during the lockdown has really I've gotten friendly with the computer. I decided we have to be friendly. <laughs> and, and you know, that makes such a difference. But I've often said in caregiving, this is a wonderful way to get the children, uh, the young people involved, because they can make all of that sort of thing happen. And it gets them involved in caring because absolutely. we can bring skills to the table. Right, absolutely. I wanted to ask you, if Sam, or, or I'm sure you've encountered this, um, Greg, but were, was there ever any problems I, with, um, I mean, I'm learning as we talk to different uh, survivors, the uh, solo artists, that sometimes it was, it's very hard to get the care that you need or want. Um, that sometimes the healthcare system isn't always quite as easy as we wish it were. <laughs> Uh, is this something you came across at all during your I, I, trials? I, I think the biggest question answer to that, and it's in the show and often comes up in the dialogue, is knowing whether you're getting the best. You are people. We're not medical people. And the interesting thing, and we've seen it differently, and it, everybody does it differently, Susan liked her doctor right away. She's a very matter of fact person. He's my doc. Me? And this is, you remember the scene, Greg? Yes. What about going to uh, Mayo? What about going to this place? Why don't you go, you know, let's go get the second and fifth opinions. You know, I want to, and it was an aha moment. I mean, it took them, it, it's, you know, I'll do it. It's a struggle. And me, because I'm also the guy, right? Let's be clear. The guys like to be and think we should be in charge. I want to say, you, I'll tell you how to be treated. And it took me a bit, not a little bit. Uh, take the breath and say, it's her, her call. I don't get to decide those things. Mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you also that because we've had a happy ending, that's okay. I don't know what it meant me had it turned out differently and I not insisted. Uh, so it's not a risk-free 
decision. So how do you know you're getting the other line? Put it, the line in the play might best be said. Uh, I look at the audience and say, how do you pick a cancer doctor? Mm -hmm. How the hell do you pick a cancer doctor? You know, it's it's a wild game. I mean, even today in some of the stuff, you listen to the different th opinions about uh, the virus and what to do and not to do. How do we as lay people know? Right. One uh, has to learn how to become an advocate. And I think that's one of the things that we're going to be seeing in the coming weeks as we um, look at um, Solo Art Heals because, um, you know, uh, sometimes it doesn't work in, in, in the way you want it to and you need to find sources outside of your medical system. And, um, the, and people are very generous and you start learning about, you know, a wider circle and a wider thing. I had myself had a lot of problems um, over the years um, caretaking with, with my husband. Um, and in fact, we have some questions here. Um, and I noticed one is from Valerie David. Um, I'm glad she's with us tonight because she's gonna be performing um, her segment, I do hope coming up the next month of her uh, wonderful show, The Pink Hulk. She is a three-time cancer survivor. And um, I'm sure she'll have something to say about this. But she, her question for you is, what is next for the actual dance? How do you want to adapt this if you can't perform it live? and how to expand because of this. And she also said outstanding performance and thank you to both of you. Um, and, and I do wanna mention, I think you have a show upcoming in Santa Barbara, is that right, Sam? Live stream. That you've done that. I've done that. That's, that oh, part of me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Live stream people can I, I hope it. Well, the <laughs> next big thing is I'm, I'm working on the book version of the show. And I'm hoping by the fall it'll be out, and, it, and so both the book and and the the, the performances, the the performance, as we all as know. Thank you, Stephanie, in particular for this opportunity, and you, Gail, and for the fellow artists who are becoming a collaborative, so we can, you know, be recognized. The theater is going to be different from now on. But you know, I. I don't have a new show scheduled. I we did have the Santa Barbara. Um, oh, it on stage. Uh, no, the Center Theater there uh, was part of their program and had was interviewed for that. Uh, I hope to get out and do a live thing at the stage, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> That's what um, we had another question asking if you might come to the Marsh um, and how people could see your full show. Um, I don't know if you are yeah, yeah, having them available on Vimeo, um, which reminds me, I don't want to forget, we do have a tip jar because everybody's kind of, um, you know, struggling along right now. So if you would like to um, to support the Marsh and, and support um, the, the Marsh stream, um, there's a tip jar. We welcome you to, to uh, please um, donate as you wish. And, um, and, uh, and, and is there a way to see your full show at, at all right now? I, I have chosen not to make it available on video. Um, okay. It's too emotional and I don't feel comfortable in a, uh, in, in a full video performance of it for that reason. I've never had, I mean, I, you know, there's some fairly cruder versions for training purposes available, but I mean, but so that's my been my choice so far. I might eventually change it. Depends um, on how the world is. <laughs> yeah, but my goal is, uh, you know, and just to go back. This is my fourth age, where I've been fortunate enough to have had a career, and we're well settled. And while we like to recover our cost, our my my we have a mission of everybody who needs to see the show to have an opportunity to be able to see it and experience this conversation as well. And so, um, you know, I want I do want to get out there and be in the present and hopefully use this time wisely to finish that book. <laughs> Good. Talk about a while. Cause I love doing it. I mean, I love doing the show. Uh, well, it's apparent you have so much feeling in it. And uh, every time I've seen it and I'm so glad that um, both you and Susan are here and healthy and well. And um, 
I want to ask um, Greg if you might have any closing um, closing mm -hmm. comments. Mm -hmm. Well, I just, a closing comment would be to thank you and Stephanie and the whole crew <laughs> in San Francisco for making this possible. It's, it's such an important and such a necessary and really a blessing to so many. I, I feel totally blessed having met all of you and having spent this time together. What I would like to just urge people is there are a number of things that, um, uh, links that I shared, and if Indeed, people are looking for caregiving work, particularly, I, I, this is not a commercial plug, but uh, this little book, mm. Care for the Family Caregiver, A Place to Start. I was privileged to write that with a colleague uh, in uh, 2005 for the White House Conference on Aging, and we've continued to update it, to this being the 2018 version. And it really is, a tool that people can use physically, emotionally, and spiritually. It's not a commercial product at all. I'm just very grateful that 20 years ago, Emblem Health invited me to create the caregiving program and bring attention to the silent patients. And the mandate was the employees, the members, and the world at large. Well, we continue to do that. But this little booklet is always a wonderful place to start because no one goes to school to become a caregiver. Many times somebody wakes up in the morning and the person next to them has had a medical procedure, something has gone wrong, and you're in the world of family caregiving. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was the purpose of this. Yeah, so, I love the term silent patient. It's very interesting because, yeah, it is the silent patient. And in your booklet, you give a lot of information like managing medications, preparing and administering intravenous feedings, things like we have to do sometimes, as I certainly did with my husband. You kind of have to learn how to be a nurse, giving injections and helping assist with devices for mobility and uh, preparing special food. For that is because they, they come in, you're in the hospital. And all you're thinking about is getting your loved one home and out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, you do this, you do that, and you do this, and you get home. And suddenly, I it was for me, I had all these, and I said, what do I do with them? <laughs> I wasn't trained in that world. Mm -hmm. uh, so we learn a great deal. And, and it's one of the reasons, too, that support groups are so, so important. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. fortunately, the uh, computer and Zoom and these sorts of things make that so well, this is Sam, you make that point so much. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say that Sam makes that point so much with how the, it's a new language. You know, what, what are the margins and, and you know, yeah. all, all these words that suddenly you haven't heard before and you start having to learn a new vocabulary. And Steve, did you have a question? I just want to say it's time. And I wanted to thank everyone. What a... a full program, incredible performance, incredible to meet you all, incredible, Greg, your, your talk back with it, Gail, what a wonderful host. And I just think it's just so full of stuff and really shows how important this uh, solo arts heals. And I wanna say, introduce about next week, yeah. because next yeah. week we have Adam Strauss, the mushroom cure excerpt in discussion. and. Um, um, join Adam Strauss for an evening of psychedelic medicine. Um, he's going to give uh, screen excerpts from a, a previous Marsh performance um, of The Mushroom Cure, followed by a discussion with a psychedelic therapist. So um, stay tuned for that next week. Thank you, everyone. And we'd love Thank to you. see you at our theater, Sam. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Stephanie. Thank, Thank you for this. Season. Thank you all. Thank you, audience. Good night, Thank Stephanie. You.